The Open Scroll The Sign for the Bride, Part 1C And now, let's pick up where we left off last time. So that in his time, he will be revealed. Paul indicates that his readers have been adequately informed on the subject of the restraining. And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 6. He's not inviting us to speculate about what or who is the restraining agency. Most of us scratch our heads and wonder if we might have been absent when he gave that lecture, but he actually makes his point right here in the immediate context. But few take notice. The point being made about keeping Pneuma Antichristos in check is that there is a set time for this. There is a season for restraining and a fit moment appointed for its release. Reread verse 6 until this sinks in. The Greek word used here for time is kairos, which is defined as a fixed and definite time. If you're generally ignorant about how the Lord keeps a tight schedule in this age and that the key events have been encoded into his calendar, you have not been doing your homework for a long time. I don't mean to be insulting, but the Lord has been revealing these things and had his servants publish them to make it accessible for many years, and many of us are guilty of negligence. Paul made a declaration in his first letter to the Thessalonians that is similar to verse 6 above. That will be understood as having had paramount importance in the day appointed for the revealing of the lawless one when it will be seen that ignorance of these scheduled appointments, and this one in particular, has costly consequences. Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 and 2. I expect to be writing more on that subject, having recently refined and expanded the work I had done years ago on the thematic structure of the passage that includes chapter 4 in its scope. The saints have been misled about the basis for destruction. We have been set up, and we have deserved it. If you digested the recommended study titled Baptism the Prophecy, you understand how Yom Kippur, a.k.a. the Day of Atonement, was instituted as a holy day, in no small part, to prophesy of, and describe in its fulfillment while legal matters in the spiritual realm were addressed, and memorialize our Lord's baptism. If you are familiar with the collateral study titled, When Jesus Was Baptized, The Celestial Signs, you have even more insight into how things are done in the Lord's economy. The understanding of times and seasons compares to the frame of a jigsaw puzzle in how it provides essential scale and defines the fundamentals of contextual relation. Until you are made privy to the Lord's schedule of appointments, the events marked out, both future and past, and their relationships are at best poorly defined. When the Lord corrected my error concerning whether or not the timing of the key transitional events like the harvests would be known in advance, it was quite another epiphany. See, will no one know the day? They will be. The Lord Yeshua was baptized and anointed on Yom Kippur, but the Antichrist anointing is appointed for a different day on the calendar, a day positioned nearly exactly opposite on the annual cycle. There are several historical examples modeling the event with its timing for us in the scriptures. And these are the subject of the next part in this bookish online series on the subject of the sign for the bride. There have also been validating signs of the event and the day appointed since I've been on watch for it over the span of the last nearly 20 years. So, until you've been properly informed about the critical matters of timing, you have not yet been properly informed. Those who have not been adequately informed have wrongly supposed that not knowing makes no difference, stumbling on ahead in the dark with imaginative speculation. Hey, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Returning our attention back to verse 6, 
We see now that Paul's message wasn't placing emphasis on the identity of the restraining agency so much as on the importance of knowing there is a season appointed for the restraint that has a set limit. When the appointed time arrives, there will come an end to it. And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 6. The Pneuma Antichristos will be released at the appointed time, according to plan. The Sovereign God will assure it. The host and the agent appointed as his baptizing high priest will be fully ready in this perfectly synchronized action. The setting will be precisely according to design, and there will be a fit reception awaiting the big debut. According to the model of John 13, verse 27, Jesus himself will give the signal. At his word, a dimensional portal will open, and that spiritual entity will fall away. Apostasia and the special anointing will descend upon the host. This will reveal him, with the attendant supernatural manifestation of lying signs and wonders. The debutantes coming out party will be spectacular and unrivaled. At least, that is, until the one shows up who will end his masquerade. If you want to see a party, just wait until you see his welcome party. If you've been reading the blog for a while, you'll have come to understand this event in the language of the ancient celestial stargates and deities. Horus, by one name, will transit the silver gate to incarnate into the prepared host. You may note that the clocks and timers and hourglasses that often appear in the symbolic occult context suggests how this comes at an appointed time, as well as in connection with a special provision of control over the activation of time-space portals. With all this insight into the meaning of the passage, there's still much more to be gleaned. We've only got the core of it thus far in this document, but we should at least have that with full confidence. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him. Much of the theological sleight of hand giving a spin to the truth presented here has been facilitated by the doctrine of demons that makes a false distinction between the constructs that reveal the critical matter of timing. This, too, finds a corrective contextual guide in the thematic structure. The second part of verse 1 is matched to the second part of verse 2, so one sheds light on the other side in this thematic equation. Because with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, compares to either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. We can and must equate and clarify the descriptive constructs. These are represented in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, our gathering together to him, and the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a millennial day, the seventh and we crossed over on Yom Terah of 1999, as I've documented with confidence. There are mistaken notions about this, which aren't really germane to this study. I've sufficiently addressed this in other studies. The coming of the Lord can be represented in a long sequence of events that actually began from a very important perspective in 1991. That's when the celestial sign marking Yom Terah identified to us the beginning of his coming in judgment. In this sequence of events, the kind being brought to our attention is called our gathering together to him. I say kind because there's actually three of these ingatherings appointed, which are called in some contexts harvests. All three of these are in view. They are appointed to follow each other in sequence, just as laid out in the Lord's calendar. These will, all three of them, happen in connection with the coming of the Lord, not independent of it. These three will also occur during the day of the Lord, and again, for the sake of clarity, not independent of that. This understanding is in harmony with the divine organization of the message. The nonsensical, fractured mishandling of these constructs by the church authorities conflicts with this divine thematic pairing and this distortion is used to do much further damage to the message. 
The problem here isn't just a matter of the innocent being ignorant. This will become very apparent when we've come to the end of this presentation. A sign to refute the lie. Now, with the subject more clearly in view, what we're being warned about in this passage makes sense. In the overview offered in this study's introduction, I wrote that the revealing of the lawless one can be seen as a sign, as a special kind of evidence intended to assure us that the gathering to the Lord, in the day of the Lord, has not yet happened. While that's the main thrust of the message, there is more to it than that. Before we explore further, let's make sure we're clear on the main point, which everything else hangs on. When we read through verses 1-12 through 12 of 2 Thessalonians 2, we can see how there is an abundance of what might be considered extraneous information. It's not superfluous, of course. Paul isn't just rambling on in a clumsy attempt to communicate some vague sense of comfort, as demonstrated by the thematic structure that betrays its divine source. But we have to distill from all that what point is being made. The author has not made it easy for us to discern the truth of it. The essential message can still be distilled from the first three verses. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Second Thessalonians 2, verses 1-3 through 3. Paul is making a request, entreating, beseeching, imploring. His concern is that the saints will be quickly shaken from their composure, the threat is very specific. It involves some report to the effect that the day of the Lord has come, which is to say that it has already passed. Why is it so important that the composure of the saints is not quickly shaken? What difference does it make if the saints are disturbed by such a report? Our hope is at stake, our reward. If there is no ingathering to the Lord in our future because this has already passed, our hope is for naught, and our faith is destroyed. Consider what he had just written in chapter 1. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment, so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which indeed you are suffering. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to give relief to you who are afflicted, and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God, and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction, away from the presence of the Lord, and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day, and to be marveled at among all who have believed, for our testimony to you was believed. 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 4-10 through 10. Whew! When you have mopped up your tears and regained your composure, oh, the Lord is so good to us, consider the value of this hope we have. If you have not already had such a personal revelation about it, Try to imagine if there were some demonstration of evidence that convinced you that your hope was unfounded. If you had truly had such a hope, you would be completely devastated. Here's what Paul wrote to the Corinthians when he was about to share with them some comforting truth about their hope. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus for merely human reasons, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink. For tomorrow we die. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 32. What Paul was entreating the Thessalonians about in the focal passage wasn't unwarranted. He wasn't just responding to rumors. 
Paul's robust description of the threat reveals that it's more substantial than just a rumor. Although rumors with false evidence had probably been circulating in their communities and the faith of some had already been shaken, his entreaty was not just for them then. It was for every saint where this epistle was read, providing for us, even today, a substantial basis for maintaining a reliable defense that can stand up in the face of convincing lies about the harvest having come and gone, with all hope of just reward. When saints are confronted with such a lie, and there is substantial evidence provided in support of the claim, how can such as that be refuted with confidence? We have been given a sign for just that reason, and either it is so adequately defined and reliably recognizable that even in its absence we can be fully assured of our hope, or Paul's elaborate precautionary entreaty is impotent, feeble, and pointless, a swing and a miss. So, which is it? Is the church going to fall into apostasy and then the lawless one will be revealed? Or, is the church going to be raptured, then the lawless one will be revealed? Is there substance in any of that to refute anything? Or is that not the point of the message? Is there anything in such nonsense but confusion? How absurd! What a ludicrous mess! That doctrine of devils! The pre-trib rapture theory being promoted by so-called prophecy experts is utter claptrap. What a huge setup. The other popular theories, mid, post, pan, pre-wrath, all of them are faulty, part truth, and therefore untrue and wholly unreliable. Brethren, what you believe matters. Plenty. Do you have false hope? That's bad. Is your faith based on lies? This is going to be exposed, and your faith will fail. I'm not making nebulous warnings here. I'm going to give it to you straight from the scriptures, untwisted, with the Lord's help. Some months ago, the Lord began to impress upon me how this message of Second Thessalonians 2 was most particularly and very specifically intended for a people who will witness the event described as the sign. Perhaps you, or someone who hears your testimony, because it's now not far distant. Many claim that this is not the stuff of salvation, but that is another one of the devil's lies. Folks, we've been set up. If it has been easy to be deceived in this day and hour, just wait another year. When you see what the divinely appointed thematic equation has to reveal about the primary audience for Paul's cryptic message, which has been so incredibly targeted by the ministers of misinformation and disinformation, you'll understand why I've been required to update this study with this insight in this late hour. Now no one after lighting a lamp covers it over with a container or puts it under a bed, but he puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret that will not be known and come to light. So take care how you listen, for whoever has, to him more shall be given, and whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, shall be taken away from him. Luke 8, verses 16 through 18. A Sign for the Bride Now, one of the implications of this very obscure message delivered by Paul is that, at the revealing of the lawless one, that which was promised would not come first will logically follow after that signal event. Once the sign is witnessed, those who recognize it will know that the gathering to the Lord is impending. At least some of them, perhaps all those involved as witnesses in that day, will know that three harvests will come in sequence at their appointed times, and at least some of those saints will understand about their role in the impending barley harvest, which I also refer to as the bride theft. The baptism and anointing of the Antichrist beast will thus be a sign for the bride when it happens, who alone will be awake and alert and sober in that day, excepting the 144,000 sons of Israel and two witnesses. 
the dramatic revealing will indicate the nearness of her bridegroom's approach. Given how the body of Christ today appears to be suffering from an overspreading blindness, if the Lord has opened your eyes and ears and granted you the grace to perceive the truth about the sign, I encourage you to thank Him and honor that by pursuing hard after the opportunities that appear before you to enter fully into the Lord's provision and accept the sufferings and the glory. The Lying Report A Supernatural Multimedia Hoax I mentioned at the outset how a third element in the sequence of events is directly related to the two that follow it. That element is the lie itself, the threatening report Paul was entreating us about, which is to the effect that the day of the Lord has already come. Like I just mentioned, the Lord has been impressing upon me how this message of 2 Thessalonians 2 was intended primarily for the saints who would actually witness the revealing of the lawless one. What had so long ago threatened to shake the composure of the Thessalonians was a foreshadowing of what is about to come. After he began to impress this upon me, I began to see models of this being dramatized in media. I wrote at some length about this during the recent Winter Olympics, because this deceptive report was modeled during the opening ceremony and then again in the closing ceremony. If you read Part 3, Sochi Winter Olympics 2014, The Ultimate Hoax, which I recommend for a collateral study, you'll find a fair synopsis of much of what you are reading here. What I've discovered since the Olympics is what I'm about to demonstrate. I believe what the Lord was revealing about a supernatural multimedia hoax is validated by the thematic structure of 2 Thessalonians 2. A little over a week ago, I returned to my earlier work, a version of the structure I think was unchanged from 1991 except for updating the presentation to one that is interactive. It was speaking to me of a need for further refinement because it was not as granular as I suspected the divine design probably was, based upon insight acquired during the hundreds of hours I invested over the years in the analysis of entire chapters of Scripture. The Lord granted me the favor to bring it into the state you explored earlier in the interactive frame, and which you see below. After becoming satisfied with this refined version, which I find far more compelling, I reflected upon the deeper insights offered by the newly discovered thematic equations. What the Lord had worked with me to discover in 1991, which facilitated the key insight about the baptism, was quite intact. What really struck me now was how the extensive description of the massive deception that would obviously attend a baptism and subsequent fraudulent messianic ministry was directly matching to the description of the report that Paul was entreating us about. Wow! The connections I'm going to be pointing out weren't apparent to me prior to this recent analysis. All the content describing the sign is set within bracketing elements that describe the deception. When I shared this refined presentation with Aaron, we marveled together at how awesome and masterful the Lord is in crafting His Word. How touching is His loving care in tending to our need in these last days. What is coming is going to be most challenging, but the Lord has ordained that there will be overcomers. When we read in the opening line of verse 3, Let no one in any way deceive you, we want to observe how a notable deception had just been described in verses 1 and 2. The thematic companion to verses 1 and 2 is easily seen to have deception as its primary theme too. In a reading of the passage as it is normally read, straight through in sequence, we must connect what's in verses 9 through 12 with the event of the revealing of the man of lawlessness. That's entirely valid, of course, and we should understand how this signal event we've identified as a fraudulent messianic baptism will be attended by terrasin sudus, which the interlinear renders as wonders of falsehood. Yet, with the benefit of having discovered the author's link to verses 1 and 2, we should perceive how the nature of the deception described in verses 9 through 12, which is so evidently supernatural, 
applies to the disturbing lie about the gathering to the Lord being passed that is the subject of Paul's entreaty. One side of the thematic equation sheds light on the other. What is being conveyed by the divine link is how the same kind of deceiving supernatural dynamic that is associated with the baptism is also at work in the message that threatens to quickly shake the composure of the saints. Here's the first component, with the more granular structure indicated by highlighting one set of paired elements. The pairing of the second line of verse 1 with the second line of verse 2 speaks to how the entreaty is primarily for those who live in the day of the Lord, during the season of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that this is when the threat will come. Here's the matching component, which shares the same pattern of simple alternation. This insight into the connection between the massive deception that attends the revealing and the threatening report that precedes it is actually a very big deal. If it weren't, it wouldn't be concealed in a code that has to be broken to expose the link, and which has possibly been hidden until now. What it means is that the baptism has a prelude that is equally cloaked. It reveals something of the composite character of the threat. The impression many saints have is that they are already equipped to identify the lawless one as an imposter when he's revealed. Many, of course, are convinced they will be raptured to make their escape before he can be revealed. So, already subject to delusion, they will be completely unable to resist accepting his false claims. Many have certain elements of the scenario in mind. A short list of potential candidates some kind of UFO or alien presence and disclosure, a Petrus Romanist to lend it the Vatican's authority, yet that's not going to suffice. They will fall prey because the Lord has assured it by appointing massive deception for the segue into the revealing. An opening salvo is appointed that will lay waste to their faith in one quick offensive like a spiritual blitzkrieg. Their front line of hope will be obliterated they will be found to have no more defenses than the rest of the global population against this supernatural onslaught. Then, the lawless one will be revealed. I know who won't be deceived, and I know why. And I'm going to tell you. But I also know that most of you still won't believe it. Until it's too late. We think never, no way, not us. But so it will be, for most. Before I get to that, we should have a firm grasp of how such a massive hoax could be pulled off that would convince so many of us saints that our hope is in vain, that the day of the Lord had come, and we have no other Savior but the one before us, who is about to be presented. What kind of spirit message letter supposed to have come from us could possibly be so convincing? The simple answer is, one that has a spell on it even what kind of deluding influence will come from the Sovereign God Himself. The description of the manner of transmitting the lie is given in the text as meta thoresthai, meta di penumatas, meta dia lagu, meta di epistoles, which the interlinear renders, nor to be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as if by us. There are three components that I believe may be understood as three facets of the delivery of the lie appointed for the near future. It's going to have a lagu, word or message, which we know is to the effect that the day of the Lord has come and gone by implication. It's going to involve documentation that carries the weight of highest authority of the church, even of the early apostles, which means it will be fully authorized as biblical canon. Together with the first component, spirit, it's a triple whammy, if you will. The potent combination will overwhelm any resistance to the message and result in a mass epiphany. With full conviction, even the leaders of the church, from the middle of the road out to the bike lane and to the outer edge of the shoulder, will confess that the day of the Lord has come. The proof will be impossible to deny. The evidence? Bulletproof. Well almost. That's why we have a sign. While nearly all the saints will have whatever faith they may have had destroyed, 
and turn to receive the Savior waiting in the wings along with the rest of the global population, some will be immune to the delusion, prepared in advance for that day and for a critical mission. The countermeasures for this deceptive assault are provided for us, but we have largely dismissed them, as encouraged and led by church authorities. I will address those at length. That's one of the primary objectives of this lengthy exercise in preparation for the final bride work appointed for this season in these bodies of flesh. What the thematic equation adds for our benefit is first an emphasis upon the nature of the deception involved. This will attend the baptism event that reveals the lawless one, but is most directly linked to the lie that will eliminate their resistance to welcoming the impostor as their own savior. Yes, I'm being a little repetitive here, but bear with me. There will be Teresin Sudus, which the inner linear renders as wonders of falsehood. In verse 10, we read, Passe apate adikias, every deceit of wickedness. In verse 11, informs us that energy and planes, a working of delusion, is sent by God himself. Even today, many of us can see this beginning to work where the entertainments of public ceremonies have such a spell on them. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work, according to verse 7 of this passage in 2 Thessalonians 2. So far as the technical nature of the spirit message letter deception goes, I can't really describe it better than I already did in Part 3, Sochi Winter Olympics 2014, The Ultimate Hoax, where it was so evidently on proud display. Lies were being spouted throughout the ceremony, with professional commentators misrepresenting to us what was really being enacted while using NLP to craft the intended message in a brilliant demonstration of mass mind control. The language of visual symbolism that has become so familiar to me as an exhibit of the Luciferian sorcery behind it was attended by a hypnotic soundtrack that referenced powerful memories with great subtlety. The new technologies involved in that dramatic presentation in the stadium merged the real with a projection that was nearly indistinguishable from the real. That overlay of the virtual upon the real will be further enhanced and extended. This and other presentations like it are akin to rehearsals for the opening day of an epic farce. These should be recognized for what they really are, elaborate workings of sympathetic magic that are practiced according to the way of ancient magicians. What will result from all this effort is going to be the science magic of an alchemical working, the binding of heaven and earth, the exploitation of control temporarily granted over time space for the breaching of a boundary layer and interface between heaven and earth. I believe a live action transmission through time itself will bring forth evidence in such a way that is incomprehensible to us outside the experience of personally receiving insight via divine revelation. This streaming connection may well facilitate interaction through the portal, yet it will be fraudulent, contrived to convince the world of a lie. CERN is mostly offline in 2014 and expected to come back online in 2015 with far greater power than before. According to some witnesses, the LHC has produced certain kinds of special effects that should not be discounted. I believe new and ancient technologies will all be exploited in this epic multimedia hoax, and with the sovereign God providing the energy and planes, a working of delusion, you can be assured that this deception will accomplish everything intended. Now. The thematic equation inherent in the text of 2 Thessalonians 2 adds further benefit by emphasizing the basis for the countermeasures to the deception. I'm going to get to that, but I must pause for some current events. Since my attention and effort began to be focused on this passage of Scripture, two noteworthy reports have come forward from the Vatican. The timing is no coincidence. Since the papal agent will stand in for John the Baptist at the fraudulent baptism, the Vatican is going to grant its authority. The first report came out a couple weeks ago. The Vatican Library began a project on Thursday to digitize thousands of historical manuscripts, 
dating from the origins of the church to the 20th century, and make them available online. Working with the Japanese technology group NTT Data, the library intends to scan and digitally archive about 1.5 million pages from the library's collection of manuscripts, which comprise some 82,000 items and 41 million pages. The initial project will take four years and may be extended. From the article, Vatican Library will digitize its archives and put them online, dated March 20th, 2014. The Apostle Paul entreated us, warning us of a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Who is likely to produce such a document, one that might be quickly authenticated as coming from an Apostle of the early church? Is the Vatican setting us up, planning to quote-unquote discover such a document while sifting through their vast archive of manuscripts? Do they intend to produce it at some propitious moment in the advancement of some hidden agenda? That seems plausible. This next report just came out while I was updating this study. Pope Francis will become the first pontiff seen globally in 3D during the upcoming April 27th ceremony in St. Peter's Square when two of his predecessors, John Paul II and John XXIII, will be canonized as saints. The unprecedented double canonization event will be produced in 3D by the Vatican TV Center, CTV, in a partnership with Rupert Murdoch's Sky Italia, B Sky B, and Sky Deutschland, Payboxes, and Sony. The ceremony will also be beamed into 3D movie theaters across Europe and in North and South America in what is being touted as the first convergence of HD, 3D, in 4K technologies for such a high-profile multimedia 3D event. At a press conference in the Vatican, CTV chief Monignor Dario Vagano said the live transmission will require more satellites than the Sochi Olympics. Vagano underlined that the Vatican decided to offer the canonization ceremony to the world in 3D in order to give people who would want to attend but cannot, for many reasons including economic ones, the chance to get a fully immersive experience. The production will use 13 3D cameras positioned in spots that will give a unique and exclusive vantage point of St. Peter's Square. From the article, Pope Francis to usher in Vatican 3D TV transmission at unprecedented canonization ceremony dated March 31st, 2014. Wow. Okay. Haven't I been writing about something like this? offered to the world the first convergence of HD, 3D, and 4K technologies, a triple whammy, double canonization event, live transmission, a fully immersive experience, and 13 3D cameras. The Sochi Olympics are even mentioned in a comparison of the technologies that are beyond Earth. I did mention how such a letter or epistle component would have to be fully authorized as biblical canon, right? In Revelation 13, there's a double canonization in view as two beasts arise with authority. Catholics pray to canonize saints. Ritual pre-enactments must be done as sympathetic magic brings forth the abstract over into tangible physical reality. It's the adversary's twist on prophetic modeling. From another perspective, dear saints, beans have to be spilled. This is how their game is played. We will not be able to offer excuses of any kind for being duped. But nobody told me. The adversary's way of concealing and revealing is not going to let them off the hook for what they do, because there is a judgment, and they will be held accountable. And those who are duped into sinning will also meet with judgment. We have been warned of the consequences of sin and are being told in ways both general and specific over and over again. Are we listening and hearing yet? This scenario given to Paul to lay out for our benefit is coming and it's going to be one slick trick. From the observatories on Mount Graham, Jesuit Vatican astronomers are eagerly and expectantly 
watching for the approach of something of enormous consequence. Tom Horn has been demonstrating how the Vatican is suggesting in increasingly less obscure ways that ancient visitors are coming to Earth from afar, staging a return that will require a significant change in doctrinal interpretation. The Romish Church is posturing and positioning itself to appear alongside the returning incarnating king as the inheritors of all authority in the Earth. Guess what this is going to look like in the Day of Disclosure? By now, you should be able to make a pretty well-educated guess. Yet, if you think seeing all this clearly now is going to assure that you're adequately prepared for what's coming, you are still underestimating the potency and the scale of the deception. Your optimism is unwarranted. That's not going to be enough. It's just not going to be that easy. Countermeasures Against Deception, The Lord's Provision, and Our Access to It To avoid being deceived, instructions are provided in the local context and given emphasis by the thematic patterns. Clues are provided in this code that lead us to search out more remote contexts to find the more deeply hidden treasures. Some of what you'll read here was discovered very early in this adventure of discovery, but validating refinement has come in the intervening years, including very recently. When I claim to know who won't be deceived and why they won't be, and that most of you won't believe it until it's too late, this is not me making stuff up to sound dramatic. I pray we will find the Lord's grace in conviction. I'm going to start out by giving you a simple bottom line on who won't be deceived. The bride, with two witnesses, and in that same season, the 144,000 sons of Israel. That's it. And relative to the numbers, 144,000 is immense. If you're identifying yourself with the bride company without having the assurance of direct and personal revelation insight from the bridegroom concerning your end, you've been set up. Be honest and sober. We are candidates potential members of that company who continue to strive for qualification to be found worthy at the end of our struggle. Now, let's observe how the paired components of verses 1 and 2 and 9 through 12 both exhibit the same pattern, a simple alternation. They match both in being paired together as companion elements and in sharing the same structural design. In the closing section, the first and third lines feature the deception, and the second and fourth, the countermeasures. Here's the thematic equation that declares the fundamentals of the countermeasures. Because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved, matches to verse 12, in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. Most folks are content to gloss over the preachy bits, but if you have a sense of what's at stake, you won't. This revelation may seem kind of generic, but there is in this the foundation for the particulars. You may become tempted to skim through this. Please don't. What might be uncomfortable now might just be a lifesaver in days to come. The Foundation if you don't make the grade when receiving the love of the truth is the requirement of the day, or are assessed as one who does not believe the truth, you will be deceived. It's guaranteed. Some might ask, well then, what is the truth? That's more than a little vague. And what exactly is meant by receiving the love of the truth? Is that what happens when we make a profession about Jesus as our Savior and get baptized? If we're still relying on the same church authorities who have botched the lessons of the rest of this passage to provide these answers, well, good luck with that, as the expression goes. If it really is just all about being saved in the popular evangelical sense, we can just give that our every effort and forsake everything else. But it's not. Have you received insight into the Great Commission, leavening, and invocation? 
what is all twisted up with partial truths is doomed to failure. And at the high cost of the forfeit of reward for those who neglected their own gifts for the sake of it. It's time to wake up. Hear me when I tell you that if you don't get this foundation of the love of the truth and believe the truth, the rest won't matter because access to the essential particulars will be denied. The way most of us are taught to read the Bible, the good stuff applies to us, the bad stuff applies to them. We learn to think with lots of persuasion. We're saved. We believe the truth. It's all good. No problem here. I was once blind, but now I see, as the song goes. We look at others, and we are confident that those poor saps over there are in serious trouble, and take solace in being able to perceive a difference. When our brand of salvation happens to be the standard for measurement preached by our respected and beloved teachers, we're content. The more popular church of the wider way sings a droning lullaby that continually assures us of our secure position through a twisting of the scriptures. And all the while they're impressing us with their genuine spiritual gifts and show of authority. It's a setup. If we've come this close, you and I, and we still miss out, shame on us. To simply say we're going to regret it is to understate the immensity of what we're going to experience and fully deserve. I'm not going to launch into a diatribe on salvation, not because it's not needed, but because this is not the place. If you have not taken what I've written about matters of faith and obedience, like how to develop a hearing ear, the practice of head covering and matters of gender propriety, and the need to come to a place of being ready to lay down this life as a friend for a friend, you've taken a wrong approach to this work of the open scroll. This food service operation really isn't a buffet where you can simply get your fill at the dessert table while opting out on the bitter veggies and such, depending on the fast food joints dotting the neighborhood to round out your diet. I haven't been exposing the nature of the church and its flawed focus on the Great Commission and the nature of this world and the devil's devices by decoding occult symbolism or examining reverse speech for its entertainment value. There's a greater purpose, which is why there's nuggets of truth preached throughout, which most of you reading this blog simply dismiss, and you know it. If this is you, what has been neglected in this lengthy season of preparation may yet be gained which is what the season is for that we're now transitioning into. Pure gold must be refined in the fire over and again until it's pure enough. Here's a sobering observation you may have missed. If you're betting on attaining to the wheat harvest as a fallback plan if you should fail to qualify for the barley, you should have a grasp of who is going to qualify for that. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, These who are clothed in the white robes, who are they and where have they come from? I said to him, My Lord, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 7, verses 13 and 14. Read the context. The sealing of the 144,000 is pretty much concurrent with the barley harvest. The multitude pictured with white robes came out of the Great Tribulation, which means they had white robes already, but were passed over as the bride because they were soiled. Those saints live through the bride theft, and the revealing of the lawless one, and the black awakening, deadly pandemics, and every other threat of the approaching season. Will you? What if you don't? Then what? There's one more harvest awaiting. There you go. Imagine the forfeit. Sure, there's going to be a scale of reward involved, but think about what Paul was given to reveal about the resurrection bodies in 1 Corinthians 15. Star differs from star in glory. Sure, and that's awesome. But look up. 
how much brighter are the moon and the sun? Consider 1 Corinthians 3 verses 10 through 15 as a simple companion to chapter 13's insight into the celestial display. How badly do you want the truth? Enough? When I tell you how few will qualify, you should let this example bear witness. It's more than a morality tale like Aesop's fables or a nebulous warning. Example means type, typos, a pattern to which a thing conforms like the imprint a seal makes in wax. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now these things happened as examples for us, so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally as some of them did, and twenty-three thousand fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1-11 through 11. Think about the numbers. Joshua and Caleb were the only two adults who survived to enter the Promised Land. The others survived by the Lord's provision of mercy because He didn't hold those accountable who had been under the age of twenty. Even Moses failed to enter in. So, how's your confidence level? Have I made the point? As it was with Israel in the wilderness, so it will be with the church. There's not going to be a notable difference in leniency toward the saints. Unto whom much is given, much more is required. I consider myself to be a hopeful candidate, daring to make no presumption about having the ability to rightly judge my own status. The Particulars For the few who are getting the foundation right by believing the truth and receiving the love of the truth in advance of the day of the breakout event, entrance may be granted with much grace into that knowledge which is of a more specific nature. If you're fuzzy about how this works, you still haven't grasped the keys to developing a hearing ear, the simple but critical dynamic of the hear-do cycle. When it is written in Hosea 4 verse 6 that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, it's not some quantity of general knowledge they lacked, but rather what was required for avoiding destruction, which is to say what pertained to salvation in their specific situation. This can be identified with obedience on some level, which is truly a demonstration of sincere and genuine love. There are commandments and insights of both more and less universal kinds involved. In the season Paul entreated us about in 2 Thessalonians 2, it will be just that same way. I have confidence that the Lord brings fit truth to all the right people at all the right times and in all the right ways. He can do this any way he wants, of course, because he's sovereign, but he brings us to a certain expectation by his faithfulness with a consistent record of preparing a people in advance of a work that comes together in the appointed time of need. I was made aware that I was being engaged in such an effort when he began to deal with me about the signs of the end times. Earlier in this study, I gave some attention to the subject of the particulars. In the section titled, so that in his time he will be revealed, I describe how the following verse offers a very subtle but key insight. And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 6. If you are such a one who knows, really and truly knows, it's because you will have been entrusted with knowledge and understanding, extended on the basis of having received the love of the truth and believing the truth you will have knowledge about what is meant by in his time. 
Until you are properly informed about that key element, you don't really know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. Unless you personally qualify for access to the secret, you're denied that great treasure. Even if I said it plainly before you, you won't believe it. Oh, you may think you do, mentally ascending to a superficial and merely intellectual mode of acceptance, but the good stuff is the tight relationship with attending insight into the Lord's schedule of appointments that only comes through having earned His trust. There's no substitute for that. This is tightly secured behind the veil, reserved for those who come in to see the light. The lawless one will be revealed on the thirteenth day of the first month in the Lord's calendar. There it is, in 2015. That's probably April 4th, just under a year from now, as I write. If you are convinced, like most are, that no one will know such things, you're still in the state of sleep Paul described in 1 Thessalonians 5, which is to be deceived, lacking the necessary vision and hearing of the seeing eye and hearing ear. Some will know the times and seasons with confidence, but even that truth is sealed, hidden for protection. Knowing when the lawless one is going to be revealed with the implicit character and relationship and wisdom that comes in this package deal is the knowledge that is the countermeasure for the epic hoax. The ballpark figures of the kind of time frames being promoted in Tom Horn's Zenith 2016 and associated with the Blood Moon Tetrad promoted by Mark Biltz have a purpose, and these kinds of works may be seen as providing general witnesses. Just before Brother David Flynn went on ahead, I noted that he had come correctly to identify the year 2012 as marking the beginning of this transitional week of years. When the critical season arrives, when details are critical, flirting with the truth and believing the truth are two very different things. Missed it by that much, is still missing it. The bent tip of a spear will cause it to be ineffectual, even if it looks to most like it hits the target. Remember the foundation for knowing, which is valid and cannot be dismissed. What seems to so many saints now like matters with distinctions being made that are of no consequence will be found to be analogous to the edge of a cliff. From one perspective there's a very fine line separating the two sides. When seen from another perspective the difference is vast. I've written of persecution and betrayal and sacrifice, and a simple mention of this in this context should suffice. When I claim to know who won't be deceived and why they won't be, and that most of you won't believe it until it's too late, this is not me making stuff up to sound dramatic. There is a love test in progress, dear saints. Do you love him? Really? He's finding out. I pray we will find the Lord's grace and conviction. Before moving on to part two of this study, I recommend reviewing the section titled, So That In His Time He Will Be Revealed. This concludes our presentation of The Sign for the Bride, Part 1C. Thank you for listening.